So welcome. We are thrilled that you are all here. Um, we're very, very excited about today's program because um, we are so delighted to be working with Professor John Barrett, um, who we've had the pleasure of working with before. Um, and he was kind enough to join us remotely. Um, unfortunately, we're not at the museum in person, but we hope that we'll be able to do this again soon. But we're so delighted that so many of you are joining us today. Um, so um, as those of you who registered know, you are here to learn about the Nuremberg Trials. Professor Barrett is um, an expert on this topic. I'm going to formally introduce him before I turn the program over to him. Um, so Professor John Q. Barrett is a professor of law at St. John's University in New York City, where he teaches constitutional law, criminal procedure, and legal history. He's also the Elizabeth S. Leno Fellow and a board member at the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. Professor Barrett is a renowned teacher, writer, commentator, and lecturer on law and history topics in the United States and internationally. He's writing a biography of U.S. Supreme Court Justice and Nuremberg Prosecutor Robert H. Jackson. It will include the first inside account of Jackson's service following World War II by appointment of President Truman as the chief prosecutor of the principal surviving Nazi leaders. Professor Barrett discovered, edited, and published Justice Jackson's now acclaimed memoir, That Man, an insider's portrait of Franklin D. Roosevelt, which is both FDR biography and Jackson autobiography. Professor Barrett is also the author of numerous articles and chapters, including on Justice Jackson and Nuremberg. Um, Professor Barrett also has a wonderful email list called The Jackson List. Um, you can learn more at thejacksonlist.com. Um, those emails reach over 100,000 readers, including many teachers around the world. Before he joined the St. John's faculty, he was counselor to Inspector General Michael R. Bromwich in the U.S. Department of Justice from 1994 to 1995. From 1988 to 1993, he was associate counsel in the office of Iran-Contra Independent Counsel Lawrence E. Walsh. And from 1986 to 1988, he was a law clerk to Judge A. Leon Higginbotham Jr. of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Uh, he also serves on the board of the Historical Society of the New York Courts. He previously chaired the New York City Bar Association's Legal History Committee and served on the International Expert Advisory Council of the International Nuremberg Principals Academy in Nuremberg, Germany. He is a graduate of Georgetown University and Harvard Law School. I'm delighted to turn the program over now to Professor Barrett. Thank you so much, Amanda, um, and good afternoon to everybody. I've seen in the chat where you're all located, and it's very flattering to have uh, this number of people tune in and from so many varied locations. Um, the Museum of Jewish Heritage is of course a wonderful institution. I'm delighted always to be affiliated with them. Uh, this is the first time where it hasn't been a physical uh, lecturing teaching opportunity at the museum itself on the Battery in Manhattan. Um, we all look forward to those days returning, but on the other hand, the reach of a program like this um, probably enables many of you who wouldn't easily get to the museum to be part of this program and all of its programming. And so that is a, a good silver lining in this, this hard time. Uh, my topic today is the Nuremberg Trials. I understand that many of you are English or social studies teachers at the middle school or high school level, um, and Holocaust education being a, a core component of that and this topic connecting into Holocaust education. And of course, others of you are uh, educators or just generally interested in some aspect of this topic. So what I wanna do is begin by activating a PowerPoint deck. Um, bear with me a second, and there it is. And there's the first slide. Um, and so I'm gonna sort of begin with this notion of the Nuremberg trials. And then I'm gonna quickly, with visual accompaniment, run through nine topics. Just as a quick roadmap, uh, we're gonna begin after the Nuremberg word and concept with the Nazis and World War II, turn to Robert H. Jackson, uh, then the allies in World War II and their war fighting, war winning, and then hold the Nazis accountable project. The appointment of Justice Jackson and his initial work in London as a diplomat is my fourth topic. 
the Berg as a trial location and getting that started is my fifth topic. Six, the international agreement that creates the world's first international criminal court. Seven, the international Nuremberg trial in 1945-1946. Eight, the subsequent Nuremberg trials, there were 12 of them, so 13 that followed the international trial. And finally, ninth, the legacy of the Nuremberg trial. I'm going to try and do all of that fairly quickly so there is time for question and answer. And I know that through the chat, um, you're going to be able to send questions, which Amanda and colleagues will be harvesting. So this first image is an artist's uh, work. Um, it's from the Jewish Museum in Amsterdam. And it shows a black crow looking at a, an odd shape. Um, it's kind of heads and two rows of people. Um, if you're familiar with an image of Nuremberg, it may be this or what this image plays on because it plays on this picture of the defendants in the box, uh, in the courtroom, courtroom 600 in Nuremberg, Germany, in late 1945 and through the first nine months of 1946. These two rows of defendants, who you see backed by military police and fronted by defense attorneys, were the principal surviving leaders of Nazi Germany. And they were prosecuted at Nuremberg by the allied nations, the United States, the United Kingdom, the USSR, and France, with affiliated international support numbering dozens of other countries, uh, for crimes against the international order, for conspiring to wage World War II, for breaching the peace, and engaging in aggressive warfare, for committing war crimes, and for committing crimes against humanity. And this was the world's first international criminal trial. The American protagonist chief prosecutor is the man at the podium here, Robert H. Jackson, a US Supreme Court justice, the fellow whose biography I'm writing. Um, and he was among the equals, a chief prosecutor for the United States, really the principal prosecutor, the lead prosecutor and architect of the Nuremberg trial. Before we get to accountability on the back end, of course, this begins with perpetration. Uh, and this is the photo of Adolf Hitler reviewing uniformed troops in the heart of Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, Nuremberg was an important symbolic capital gathering place for the Nazi party. The Nuremberg party rallies occurred in September beginning in 1933 and each year thereafter until the fighting war began in 1939. Uh, so Nuremberg was the Nazis long before it was captured by the Allies and then the site of the accountability process. This is an image of one of the Nuremberg party rallies. And I think you may have seen Lenny Riefenstahl film footage showing the rallies and all their splendor and fervor and patriotism and massive numbers of people and kind of horrific adulation of the Fuhrer and what Nazi Germany was. But of course, at this starting point, it is national pride. It is a revitalized German spirit. It is a shaking off of the stigma, the shackles, the reparation obligations, the military constraints of the Germans' defeat in World War I. Um, and so Nuremberg is all of that. In 1933, the Nazis' first year in power, um, concentration camps become an important part of the Nazi system. These are political enemy gathering detention facilities without the requisites of the traditional criminal law system. And so this is Dachau, the first of the German concentration camps um, located on the north side of Munich, uh, a fully visible, uh, visited by the Red Cross, former munitions factory converted into a prison for political enemies. These were communists, these were labor leaders, these were Jehovah's Witnesses, and in significant numbers, these were Jews. And this is what the Reich was defining as enemies of the state and confining, trading, so that the pure Germans, the real Germans, the better Germans could continue on the path of progress. This is a chart that reflects the Nuremberg laws 
promulgated at the party Congress at the Nuremberg rally in 1935 that describes in a kind of eugenic diagram who constituted a Jew. If you focus on the fourth column from the right, Judah on the top, you'll see the three black dots. Um, basically, the Nazis if three of your grandparents had been a Jew, then you were a Jew. And then the Nuremberg Laws triggered consequences. You were no longer a citizen of the Reich. You were disqualified. Your property could be confiscated. The oppression and really the forces driving you to emigrate in desperation, leaving your assets behind, were embodied in these laws. And in addition to all of its perversity, one thing that the chart doesn't really reflect is that it isn't self-identification. My grandfather and my grandmother and another grandmother considered themselves Jews. No, these were Nazi officials looking up one's family tree and saying, I know a Jew when I see one. They were Jews, therefore you are a Jew. These Nuremberg laws and these forces in the journey are concurrent with the sort of quiet growing expansion of Germany Austria, the Sudetenland, uh, and it's not a shit war. These are Nazi tanks from Poland. This is the beginning of aggressive military attack by the Nazis. And from 39 uh, and Poland's quick defeat comes the invasion of the Low Countries in the spring of 1940, and then the attack on France, and then the fall of France, and the beginning of the attack on Great Britain. This is World War II in the European continent, and the Nazis are winning. This is a glimpse of what war brings and what this war brought, uh, human rights atrocities. This is one small boy whose name we'll never know, surrendering with others in Warsaw uh, in September of 1939. Um, almost certainly he perished in the Holocaust, and he's just one beautiful human face on something that is a massive numerical tragedy that accompanies the aggression and the war. Now, the war is a European problem and a rolling Nazi success. In the meantime, I want to turn to Robert Jackson, my second topic, and briefly introduce who he is. Uh, this is him in the Department of Justice, where he served as the U.S. Solicitor General and then became the Attorney General. Uh, this is him shaking Franklin Roosevelt's hand after Roosevelt had just finished appointing Jackson to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1941. Jackson was, here you have him in his judicial robes, um, really the most prominent, most successful, most re well-regarded government law figure in the United States. Um, he'd been the Solicitor General arguing and winning dozens of cases in the Supreme Court. He had run the Department of Justice and sort of risen up through the ranks handling and succeeding at lots of high profile assignments. Now he's in a non-executive branch role briefly as he's appointed to the Supreme Court, but he's somebody very highly regarded by President Roosevelt, very highly regarded for the toughest case one could need a lawyer for. And that of course becomes relevant in a few more years. In the meantime, while World War II is raging, raging Jackson is on the Supreme Court Harlan Fisk Stone in the middle is the Chief Justice. Jackson standing back right, the Junior Justice spot, is four years of justice. And 49 years old when he's appointed, 53 years old when we get to 1945. In the meantime, of course, here's President Franklin Roosevelt, one of his fireside chats. Um, the United States, after December 1941, is in the war. It's, of course, in the war in the Pacific theater because Imperial Japan had attacked the United States. But Adolf Hitler almost concurrently declared war on the United States and put us in the European war. We had already provi been providing military assistance to Great Britain, which stood alone. Uh, and Robert Jackson as Attorney General in 1940 had been part of a lot of that war preparatory and Britain aiding American involvement. But now, and this is a 1942 photo, the US is in the war and comes North Africa, and then Italy, and then Normandy, and generally the story of American military might and American economic productive capacity getting into the war, and eventually once the Soviet Union is attacked by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union becomes an ally, 
inevitably preparing to win the war. It would take years of hard, horrific fighting, but the Allies were destined to win this war. And this is apparent by November of 1943, which you see in this picture. This is the Moscow Conference. This is the foreign ministers. So you see in the middle, Molotov, uh, head bent down, the Russian foreign minister. Um, to his right is Cordell Hull, the American Secretary of State. To his left is Anthony Eden. And at this level, among other things, the foreign ministers sign an agreement that commits after the war is won that to get to hold the Nazis accountable for starting this. For as a violation of the international order, the breach of treaties as something that internationally will be part of an accountability process. That is the seed of Nuremberg. This is the Yalta Conference a little more than a year later. We're now in February of 1945. These are the principals, Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin. And at Yalta, this Moscow commitment and allied planning for the occupation and the future of Europe and the accountability of the perpetrators on the agenda and reaffirm. You see Roosevelt's gaunt face and you see perhaps death coming because in less than two months he is of course gone. Um, so now let me turn to the appointment of Jackson, uh, my fourth topic. This is President Truman who inherits the Oval Office, that big desk, uh, and that's Jackson next to him, who Truman recruits from the Supreme Court to be the U.S chief of counsel for this accountability of Nazi leaders project. At this stage in April of 1945, there's still an Adolf Hitler. And really one way to sort of paraphrase the project is that Jackson is being recruited to prosecute Hitler on behalf of the United States, along with an inner circle of other top Nazis during the summer of 1945, during the Supreme Court summer recess. Um, Jackson signs on and it's announced publicly on May 2nd, 1945. And just in that week, Hitler has committed suicide. Jackson has learned that a lot of the preparatory work had not been done, that an international plan had not been worked out in any detail, that evidence had not been really gathered. Uh, and now Jackson is the point man, a very high stature point man, and really a bid from the United States, asking the other allies to also appoint a high stature, high talent legal figure. Um, but that requires diplomacy. And so this is the jump across the Atlantic to London, which is what Robert Jackson did in June of 1945. This is Church House on the grounds of Westminster Abbey in the heart of London. Uh, it's part of the Church of England headquarters. Um, and so you see the arched doorways. This is a view from in the doorway back out at Westminster Abbey. Church House is the location of a diplomatic conference in the summer of 1945 for these four allied nations that have defeated Nazi Germany, that have captured many of the principal Nazi leaders, that occupy the land that had been Nazi Germany to figure out how they're gonna do an accountability process. They meet around a four-sided table and in many sessions, the London conference of the summer of 1945 they thrash out how to do this. The legal systems are different. The American and the British systems are largely cousins and not very different, but the French civil law system and the Soviet civil law system, both derived from Roman law, but different in certain fundamentals, are not the Anglo-American system. And exactly how we're gonna do this together is what these questions, these debates, these meetings are about. In the end, it boils down to a fundamental difference in view between the US. On the right side of the table, you see Jackson in the bow tie and the USSR, the three gentlemen with their backs to the camera in this photo, about what it means to do a trial. Robert Jackson, a US Supreme Court Justice, a former Attorney General of the United States, largely has an American constitutional law due process, not a rigged show trial view of what this is as a project. Whereas the Russians believe we have declared that these people are criminals. That's what we're here to do. We will have a trial before we hang them, before we 
finish them off. They will all be guilty. They all are guilty. We've already decided that. And of course, not to throw stones, that's a difference between a, a fair trial and a show trial, between a trial with a fair prospect of acquittal, where the outcome isn't predetermined, and an outcome that is part of the plan at the start. It's thus not clear that this can be a four nation project. It's pretty clear that it can be a three nation project. And so in the meantime, Jackson with the British, with the French begins to plan what to do with Germany. This is what Germany looked like in the summer of 1945. Germany had, Nazi Germany had surrendered unconditionally on May 8th, and this was now occupied by sectors. The pink sector in the Northeast is the Russian sector. The yellow in the Northwest is the British sector. The red, white, and blue stripes in the Southwest is the French sector. They each are adjacent to more or less the Allied powers home country. And the United States, not from the neighborhood, if you will, is the fourth, the blue segment in Southeastern Germany. Uh, to the lower right, you see occupied Austria, which is largely um, divided in a similar four nation allocation. Um, so the question is, if we're gonna do this as three nations, where are we gonna do this? And so in July of 1945, Jackson gets advice from the US Army, do it in Nuremberg. And he invites the British and the French and also the Russians to come with him to see Nuremberg as a location, as a potential trial location. Now the Russians say no thanks because they're still at loggerheads, not part of an agreement. Um, so Jackson with the other two nations flies to Nuremberg and this is what it looks like. Nuremberg had been bombed to smithereens by the Allies in 1944 and 1945. The first photo I showed you was Hitler in this same square. Um, that was in the Nuremberg party rally in the 1930s. This is what it looked like in the summer of 1945. But down the main road to the west of Nuremberg, heading towards the adjacent city of Furt, was this complex, the Palace of Justice, which was a largely intact courthouse with wheel and spoke design prison on the back. And the army said, this is in the US sector. We can secure this, we can provision it. This has a facility that can be rehabilitated. This is a suitable place to house prisoners and have a trial proceeding. And the three nations largely agree. So this is their delegation as they flew that weekend. Um, you know, there were some parts of the Palace of Justice that had been hit by bombs, but that can be fixed the roof can be patched. Uh, and so largely Nuremberg and this room, courtroom 600 in its sort of disrepair here in the summer is a location that they pick because it's in the US sector. Now it's got great associations as a matter of accountability with the Nuremberg laws and the, Nure the Nuremberg party rallies, but it's not those sort of cosmetic reasons. It is the American occupation facility sector factor that leads to the selection of Nuremberg. In the meantime, these are the new big three meeting at Potsdam in late July 1945. Um, Stalin is still the same guy who was at Yalta, but now Harry Truman is the American and uh, Clement Attlee is the new British Prime Minister having replaced Churchill who just lost the election. And at Potsdam, this new big three is discussing many topics, one of which is the impasse at London. And Jackson flies to Potsdam and lots of side meetings occur. The gist of it is that Truman says to Jackson, stand your ground, do what you think is fair. And Jackson says, well, I'm not gonna sign on to a show trial. And the Russians decide to accept the American model. That very quickly leads to the signing on August 8 of 1945 of the London Agreement. Jackson in the middle, the British handler on the left, the representative on the right. This creates the International Military Tribunal, the first international criminal court. It will be a court of four judges, one from each nation, alternates, and it will have procedures which are in a charter for the International Military Commission that accompanies the London Agreement, which provides for jurisdiction over the four crimes, conspiracy, waging aggressive war, committing war crimes, committing crimes against humanity, which will have 
prosecutors who are independent of the judiciary and judges who are independent of the prosecutors, prosecutors carrying a burden of proof, defense counsel being served with a written indictment, defense counsel of choice being selected by the defendants, discovery of relevant information so that they can make their defense, the ability to take the stand, the ability to uh, hold the prosecution to this burden. In other words, something quite a bit like the American Bill of Rights, a fair trial. That agreement from August 8 creates a project to scramble back to Nuremberg and get ready. And in terms of speed, surrender in May, Nuremberg trial starting in November is really quite amazing given the wreckage and chaos we're talking about. This is fixing up courtroom 600. Um, it's pretty quickly turning into a courtroom that can hold this international proceeding. This is the judges appointed by each of the four nations. Uh, the American chief judge is Fran Francis Biddle, who had been the attorney general of the United States following Jackson. He's the bald figure second from the left. Um, they convene as a court for the first time in Berlin. That's in the Soviet sector. That gave the Soviets a little bit of uh, face-saving appearance that it began in their sector. And then they repair to Nuremberg. The trial starts on November 20, 1945. And in the dock are arch criminals. These are criminals whose crimes aren't at a particular location. They were part of the planning. They were part of the agreement. They led sectors that made Nazi Germany as a rising power and then as a military aggressor possible. Um, of course, there's no Adolf Hitler. There's no Joseph Goebbels. Uh, in absentia, but not in actuality. There is no Martin Bormann, um, but there is Hermann Goering, who was Hitler's number two, had been head of the Luftwaffe. There's Rudolf Hess, who had been Hitler's number three, um, and kind of a loyalist and support for Hitler through his whole rise. There are the leaders of the army and the navy, the economic minister, the war production minister, the propagandist, the head of the Reichsbank, the different sectors. Plus, in addition to 24 individuals representing these sectors, six Nazi organizations are also charged in this case. Think of a prosecution of a criminal corporation. The idea was that by prosecuting and convicting organizations, the Gestapo, the SS, the high command of the Nazi uh, military leadership, in later trials, they wouldn't need to relitigate what these entities were. They could instead efficiently, quickly prosecute individuals who had leadership roles once it had been established that the entities they led were criminal. So think of a pyramid, if you will, with 24 individuals and then others down through the pyramid who are also deserving of prosecution and some of it for their roles in organizations. The organizations were to be adjudicated in the top case. This is an aerial view of Jackson at the podium. And you can see the judges arrayed on the far wall, the four national flags. In the end, they function as a court of eight. Each of the principals and each of the alternates uh, all sat through the proceedings. No principal got sick, no alternate had to replace, and they did the, the work together. Uh, you also will see in the lower edge some headphones. Each participant in the trial had headphones because this is a simultaneously interpreted for language proceeding. And each seat had headphones and a dial. So you could listen to live, if you understood the live language, or click to English, because somebody was interpreting from the other language into English, or click to German, or click to French, or click to Russian. It slowed down the pace, but it made possible this international proceeding. And here you see the judges with their headphones on. This is Jackson and Biddle back in their Washington days when Jackson was the attorney general and Biddle was the solicitor general, then Jackson became a justice and Biddle became attorney general. And now Biddle is the judge and Jackson, if you will, is under him or uh, a supplicant to him in a sense because Jackson is the chief prosecutor. Uh, this is the American prosecutorial table. Uh, Jackson in the front with his legs crossed. Across from him is his executive trial counsel, Thomas Dodd who became a US Senator from Connecticut later in his career, and a, a cast of luminaries, some incredible legal talent. To the right is the Russian table, to the left is the, the British table, 
the French table is further off to the right off camera. Um, this is eight of the defendants, um, the left half of the dock, if you will. And so you see Goering in the top left and Hess and Ribbentrop, the foreign minister, and Keitel, um, who is the head of the Wehrmacht. Here you see Jackson at the podium. He opened with a brilliantly eloquent opening statement on November 21. And in addition to his opening and closing arguments, which are majestic, handled a fair amount of witness work himself. Uh, here you see some of the press corps. You may recognize a young Walter Cronkite um, who covered the Nuremberg trial for the United Press. Um, and the world was watching. This was a public trial. Um, here you have another aerial shot. It's a little bit washed out, but it's Jackson lower right, cross-examining Goering uh, on the far left in the witness box. Um, Goering was a smart, brilliant, evil, and unapologetic defendant. And this was a, a hard cross-examination with some ups and downs. But in the end, it was document after document after document signed by, routed to, or sent from Goering that established his knowledge of the treaty breaking, the war waging, and human rights crimes that were part of the war. Um, and that was Jackson's decision in terms of planning the trial. We'll do it on the documents. We captured so much that we're not going to have to cut deals with people who are cooperators. It's not going to be a recollection battle. The words on the paper will prove the case. It meant for a slower and less dramatic trial, but it made for a historical record and a sort of uncontested evidentiary basis. Um, this is Helmar Schacht, the economics minister on the stand. Um, he financed the military buildup and the breakout from the Versailles Treaty. Um, one of the interesting things about Schacht is that when you get to the end of the trial, he's one of the three defendants who is acquitted. Um, and sort of in the ultimate sense, one of the proofs of a fair trial is when the prosecution loses. 21 of the individuals are convicted, three are acquitted. This is Albert Speer, um, the Minister of War Production, uh, which basically means keeping military factories working, a defendant who was convicted, um, the last to take the stand, and much more apologetic and sort of future-facing than Goering was. Um, Speer gets 20 years rather than the gallows, which is what Goering, who was also convicted, got. Um, this is Jackson in his office, and now he's got the etched face. Um, you can see that perhaps this was a grinding job. He missed a whole year at the Supreme Court. But from the opening in November through the closing and the judgment at the end of September 1946, the Nazis were held accountable on their documents in a public proceeding for waging the war, for planning the atrocities, for committing the horrific acts that killed millions and millions across the European continent, including the nearly six million Jews who were exterminated in extermination camps in the East, not to be confused with concentration camps had originally been started in Germany in the West. Um, this is just a final judgment ticket and this is the judgment day photo, everyone rising as the judges take the bench. After this first Nuremberg trial, there were no further international trials because 1945-46 is, of course, the start of the Cold War. So we're working together with the Russians in this courtroom, as we had worked together with the Russians to win the war, but that's breaking down. And so the Americans and the British both agree no more international trials, but Nuremberg is in that American sector, that blue part of the chart that I showed you, the map. This is Telford Taylor, uh, one of Jackson's principal assistants in the first trial, who succeeded Jackson as chief of counsel and supervised the 12 subsequent Nuremberg proceedings. These were sort of second level down the pyramid cases, and they were sectors that were either not represented in the first trial or deserving of further development. These were American only trials. And so this includes the case against the doctors who did horrific medical experiments in concentration camps. This is the case against German industrialists who used slave labor and turned civilian industries over to military production to make the Nazi military machine run. This includes the case portrayed in the film Judgment at Nuremberg, which I do commend, which is a case against Nazi lawyers and judges. Judgment at Nuremberg is not about the Jackson trial, the international trial. 
It's about the Allstadter case, the judges and lawyers case. It includes cases involving captures and killings of military hostages. It involves a concentration camp case, and it involves the political ministries in a final case, um, the foreign ministry and others that were parts of the Nazi machine. Those Nuremberg trials begin in late 1946, and they run into the spring of 1949. So one international trial in 45-46, followed by 12 American-only trials in 46 through 49. All told, less than 300 Nazi defendants are prosecuted in Nuremberg. Now, these are arch criminals. There are other trials occurring in lots of other locations, but at the top or near the top parts of that pyramid, um, this is a slice of accountability, but of course, far short of prosecuting everybody who was theoretically culpable or could have been tried. Human resources and trials and patients um, and doing it fairly don't permit everyone to be brought into the dock. So what did it yield? Well, Jackson wins uh, the Medal of Freedom from the US Secretary of War. Um, the proceedings are published. It yields an evidentiary record, not just for the trial, but for history. And so the knowledge that allows us in the decades since the Nuremberg trials to devise a word and wrap our minds around the horrors of what Holocaust is, is really based in the Nuremberg documents. Um, this is a painting by Laura Knight, a British artist that shows the connection from these people out the door to the wreckage of Nuremberg. Um, it certainly established what the Nazis were and what they had done. Um, this is a gate, Arbeit macht frei, uh, entering the Dachau concentration camp. Holocaust education and Holocaust knowledge and comprehension. Holocaust being, except on fringes of lunacy and indisputable reality, is something made possible by the Nuremberg trial. Um, this is an aerial view of a part of the Nazi party rally grounds and a museum built in Nuremberg called the Documentation Center, which is part of Nuremberg decades and a couple of generations later, taking on the responsibility of teaching in Germany, Germans, what the Third Reich was and what happened. And of course, that's a kind of legacy that was unimaginable in 1945, but liberal democratic rights respecting Germany is a legacy of the Nuremberg trial. Um, this is the world's first Nuremberg. And it's 1990 before this happens. This is the Yugoslavia Tribunal. It was possible because the unity of the world that had existed in 1945 then went away for 50 years. But after the Soviet Union ended and the Berlin Wall came down and the Yugoslavian War and its atrocities were globally televised, the United Nations created a special tribunal, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And concurrently, the Rwandan genocide was visible and a Rwanda tri tribunal was created. Um, this is the Robert Jackson Center, which I just want to commend to you in Western New York. Um, this is the Palace of Justice today. You can see they fixed the roof. And in the annex where courtroom 600 is, they've created an incredible museum called the Memoriam Nuremberg Trials, which celebrates, again, unimaginable in 1945, the four nations and the trial project, the accountability project that was done there. Um, the four windows you see up top are courtroom 600, and this is the entry to the memoriam. The judges of today have now entirely vacated this space, so it is for education and teaching as soon as COVID again permits. Um, this is the Robert Jackson United States Courthouse in Buffalo, New York, uh, a domestic honor for him. He was a Western New Yorker, um, but I've, been struck by what I think is just a coincidence. It is architecturally a bit similar to the International Criminal Court building in The Hague, in the Netherlands. The ICC is a permanent international criminal court. By a treaty uh, devised, written in Rome in 1999, and then ratified by enough nations to bring this court into being in 2002. Um, over 100 nations are part of this being in Hardy's court, but the biggest and most aren't. That includes China, it includes Russia, it includes the United States. Um, and so international justice is 
something that requires consensus and a decision and a commitment of resources and a surrendering of some sovereignty, putting yourself at risk, if you will, to being judged by this institution outside of your own shore. Um, and that has not been an American political decision to this date. Um, this is Jackson leaving Nuremberg in 1946 for the last time. Uh, he never left the United States again, although he lived on through 1954 and was part of Brown versus Board of Education in his last eight years on the court. Um, and I like it because he's smiling. Uh, he got through his hard year of service there. Um, and I like it because it reminds us that all of these projects in the end are individual. Um, each one is nudged ahead by one determined, hardworking person. It's like a teacher or like a student or a lawyer or a Zoomer or you name it. Each additional person uh, applying themselves and trying to sort of make a progress, uh, attain a higher plane is what a part of the legacy of Nuremberg is. Um, so that's my uh, tape. Um, I hope it uh, was visually entertaining uh, and I would welcome your questions. Great, thank you so much, Professor Barrett. Um, so we have a few questions um, from the audience. I'm gonna to try to get through as many as we can. Um, so one question that came up a lot um, in the chat was about Hess, um, if he pretended to go insane to avoid prosecution, and if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, Rudolf Hess had flown to Scotland uh, on his mission when he landed, uh, and was a British prisoner for the rest of the war. Uh, and was at least odd, if not deranged. The British transported him to the continent and then he ended up in Nuremberg and he, he had amnesia. He didn't recognize Goering, he didn't recognize Hitler films, he didn't you know, claim to know, know anything. And so the court, just before the trial started, appointed a panel of uh, psychiatrists to examine him. Uh, and they were about to make a determination on his competency when he stood up in court and announced that he'd been faking it. Uh, and the court said, well, you know, if you've been feigning amnesia and you now will have a memory, you're competent to stand trial. It is a fair question whether all of that was just crazy behavior. Uh, because during the course of the trial, Hess read books upside down, was constantly worried that he was being poisoned and uh, did not really testify in his final statement was a bit incoherent. Um, but was deeply culpable in the evidence uh, for his role through his part for 1941. So he was convicted and he was sentenced to life. And I think the reason why someone of his culpability did not get the rope um, was really some lingering judicial concern about his sanity. Okay, thank you. Um, there are also some questions about um, who the top officials were who were not tried and why that might have been. Right, well, the top officials who weren't tried were the, the ones who were deceased or who were missing. So Hitler was known to have committed suicide and Goebbels was known to have committed suicide and Himmler was known to have committed suicide and Bormann was missing um, and so they did prosecute him in abstention. They had an awareness, um, sort of a level down below Hit Hitler, of the, the so-called Jewish section um, in the Reich Main Security Office, headed by a fellow named Adolf Eichmann. Uh, and that this Eichmann person uh, was at a desk in Berlin, supervisory responsibility for the building of extermination camps in the East, and then on the ground, important and responsible in Hungary in 1944 for the deportation of the Hungarian Jews. Uh, but as far as everybody knew, Eichmann was dead. Um, you know, there was no body, but it was believed he'd committed suicide. He certainly wasn't believed to be a fugitive. So that, that's sort of one name that is in the, the evidentiary record and a kind of regular part of the trial. Uh, but there's no reason to believe that he should have been tried in absentia. Um, they thought he was in a grave. Now, of course, he was hiding, and eventually he made his way uh, to Argentina, and you, you know the Eichmann story from there. But he was uh, certainly defendant-worthy, uh, but not in the original trial. Um, one more person, Otto Ohlendorf, 
um, is a significant perpetrator. Um, he uh, headed the Einsatzgruppen, in which were mobile killing teams in the East. Um, and he actually testified as a witness in the international trial um, and then was prosecuted in one of the subsequent proceedings, the Einsatzgruppen case, where he was the lead defendant. Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, we also have some other questions about how Nazi officials on trial defended themselves, if they, um, you know, how effective the just following orders defense was, um, how some were able to actually be acquitted. Um, so could you speak a little bit more about that? And I, and I did sort of hold back some things because people always ask these good questions. Uh, the London Agreement creating the International Military Tribunal defined as out of bounds two defenses which historically had been part of states being able to wage war. Heads of state had immunity because that's what it meant to be the sovereign. Pick a weak nation and invade it and have a war and hope to win and even if you lose, you know, you slink away, but you're not in the dock for something. And underling immunity, that following orders was a defense. Now, if you put those two things together, nobody's accountable. Through the evolution of international law and treaties by 1945, the Allies are announcing both of those things have now changed. So out of bounds, not permitted, is a claim of head of state immunity. Um, Admiral Dönitz, who was briefly the successor of Hitler as the head of Nazi Germany, he surrendered, um, is a head of state who's a Nuremberg defendant. Uh, and following orders, being an underling, is not a defense. So how did they defend themselves? Well, they tried to offer versions of following orders um, and claimed that, you know, the kind of missing man was the law, the supreme law. Hitler, the Fuhrer principle, was the law. And they had been servants of their state, just like anyone is a patriotic servant of his own state. Um, and those sort of don't blame me, blame Hitler arguments were offered by some. Others even more aggressively said, uh, don't blame me, don't blame Hitler. We were great. We'll be remembered in a thousand years. We did what you would do. The only reason we're here is because we lost. Um, if we had won, we would have tried Eisenhower you won, so you're trying us, but we have nothing to apologize for. That was Goering's line. A few, um, maybe for tactical reasons, but maybe with some authenticity, um, made statements of contrition. Um, Hans Frank, who was the head of the occupation in Poland and beyond, the general government, um, found a religious conversion and said a thousand years would pass before the sin of Nazism um, should be forgotten. Um, but wasn't really denying his culpability. And then finally, a fourth thing that people did was they claimed ignorance. Um, you know, they knew about the part that was in their portfolio, but these horrible things that were happening, exterminations, and civilians, and so forth, that wasn't known to me. Um, and some of those claims were um, easily disproven, uh, and some of them were hard to disprove because the sort of smoking gun document had not been located. Albert Speer was one person who claimed, you know, I was the minister of war production. I was keeping these factories running. They were using laborers. I didn't know where they came from. I didn't know they were slaves. I didn't know they were being worked to death. I didn't know they came from extermination camps where they had been um, spared at the sorting platform and the other half of the line went to the, to the gas chambers. Um, today, subsequent to the Nuremberg trials in the decades of digging in historiography, there are many, many more documents showing what a liar Speer was. But that denial of knowledge of the worst of it and a kind of urbane, handsome, eloquent, uh, fear of nuclear war tactic um, got him his 20 years and avoided the gallows. Um, and related to the idea of culpability and who um, might not have been prosecuted. There are also some questions about companies like IBM who um, worked with the Nazis or provided um, supplies to the Nazis. Were they ever tried and were they ever found culpable? Yeah, not, not IBM. Let's be, let's be sure to right. <laughs> share IBM. IBM's only contrib contribution uh, to the Nuremberg trial was the, uh, the translation system, um, right. the microphones and so forth. Um, IG Farben, 
uh, and various other German corporate conglomerates uh, were uh, parts of the industrialist cases that followed in the subsequent proceedings. Um, those were civilian industries that turned their technology and their facilities over to military production and used slave labor. Um, and there was an effort to hold them accountable. Um, you know, the, the Krupp uh, industrial conglomerate, for instance. Um, the father was one of the would-be original trial international defendants, but found to be incompetent, uh, senility. Uh, his son was prosecuted and convicted and briefly stripped of his assets in one of the subsequent trials. Um, there are also some questions about the ramifications of the trial. So if, for example, um, multiple people were found innocent or if the trials had never occurred, what would the ramifications have been? And I know that's hard to get into hypotheticals when we're talking about history, but in your opinion, what would the ramifications have been? But actually in the planning stage, uh, Jackson presented a report to Truman in June of 1945. It was sort of a 30 days in progress report where he had done a survey trip to Europe and met with Eisenhower and met with European nation allied counterparts. And he was saying to the president, um, there are really three options. Um, one is to just let them go to sort of as nations had historically regard war as something that is a sovereign prerogative. You know, we won, we control the assets, we can, you know, take what we want and we can, you know, but let them slink away. And Jackson said, that's just too light and too easy, given what the allies have done in fighting what American families have paid in, you know, blood and sons, um, you know, that, I think that is an unacceptable thing. At the other extreme, we can line them up and shoot them. You know, they are our prisoners. They've surrendered unconditionally. Uh, it's just a sort of final act of warfare and executive power to mow people down. And it might be a dozen, it might be a hundred, it might be a much bigger number, but firing squads can finish that. And you, Mr. President, have the power to do that. But, and here is, I think, Jackson both um, showing his morals and sensing the morals of his audience and his nation. He said, that will not be a decision that our children look back on with pride. In between those two extremes, do nothing, you know, do summary justice. We can try and bring the rule of law to this wreckage of war. It's improvisational. This has never been done before. It will require... Uh, a lot of diplomacy on the front end. Undoubtedly, we will make mistakes, uh, but we can sort of show the world by proof what these people did that is evil, that by pre-existing standards we all regard as evil, that makes it appropriate to punish them. Now, at the end of the trial, 18 individuals are convicted, and uh, of 24, one was in abstentia, and two, one committed suicide, and one was found incompetent. So 21 are in the box, 18 are convicted, and three are acquitted. Uh, and of the 18 that are convicted, 11 are sentenced to death, and the seven others are sentenced to terms of years, ranging from Hess getting a life sentence, and Spear getting 20 years, and so forth. Um, that was the tribunal. That wasn't Jackson. That wasn't the prosecutors. That was the independent assessment of the judges of what the evidence showed, who was guilty, and who deserved what punishment. And that's a, a kind of deliberative process that allows us to assess and criticize in spots, but generally um, admire the self-restraint restraint and the kind of um, proportionality and care that was involved in judging them. Um, I think it's what makes our domestic law enforcement sometimes impress us, and it's what we try to do in this world context. There are also um, some questions about lower level Nazis, so not the people in the decision making positions, but um, people who were um, lower down party members or had roles in the camp like Capos. Were, did they face prosecution? And if not, what happened? Well, to them? I mean, ma many did, and across the landscape of occupied Germany and the sort of newly reconstituted, liberated. Um, European landmass, uh, every place had governmental power. So there were Polish trials, there were Czech trials, there were Russian trials. Lots of people became Russian prisoners and were sent to the Gulag and never came back and so forth. There were Italian trials. 
there were French and British and military trials. Those are people whose crimes occurred in the localities. The Commandant of Auschwitz is tried by the Poles in Auschwitz in 1947 and found guilty and, and hanged right there in Auschwitz. Um, so, you know, there's that sort of landscape of criminals and accountability processes. But don't certainly forget the other half of this. Um, the number of people who are citizens of the Reich, who are fighting soldiers, who are perpetrators, who are contributing to the crimes of Nazi Germany is much bigger than all those processes ever deal with. Um, there is a civil, uh, administrative, and really a uh, very light process called denazification, which at least tries to administratively look at what people were before releasing them, them out to their ongoing life in what became East Germany or West Germany. Um, justice is also, be complete or total. Um, yeah. The question is, did some get done here? Right. Um, some people are also raising the issue of um, Nazis who came to the United States after the war during the Cold War. Um, and I just want to mention, um, we did have some programming on that um, in the past. If um, anyone is interested in learning more about that, you can go to our YouTube channel. We had um, Eli Rosenbaum, who um, is from the Office of Special Investigations, who helped prosecute um, Nazis who came here illegally by lying about their involvement in Nazi activity. Um, so if you go to our YouTube channel, there is more about that because I see quite a few people are interested in that. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time left to go into that. That's a whole other history um, that, you know, we um, we could explore. But I encourage everyone to check out our YouTube channel. Um, so I think we have time for about one more question. Um, one question that also came up a lot was, how did America become so prevalent and dominant in the trials? How, why, how did they take such a leading role compared to other countries? Well, a, a couple of things. Um, it wasn't fought on our landmass. So although we did pay a human toll that was considerable, uh, we were not devastated and destroyed physically or economically. So we were able to sort of govern ourselves and deploy our resources. Um, and we had done that by joining the war and supporting Great Britain. And then with the Russians really winning the war from the other side, defeating Nazi Germany. So we had, you know, sort of economic and military might, but um, sort of national stability. Uh, and we also had a principal leadership that early on uh, Roosevelt and his cabinet, and then Truman and his principal advisors, and Jackson and the team that did the work at Nuremberg with Jackson, and then Taylor and his teams. Um, believed in the rule of law and believed that this was a principled way to fairly deal with what the Nazis had done and also to protect the world from a World War III, from a resurgent Nazi or other uh, war making which they thought humanity couldn't survive. So it was worth the effort in the American perspective. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I want to once again thank Professor Barrett for joining us today. Um, I want to thank all of you who attended for joining us today, um, our teachers who are such an important audience to us, as well as our members and donors. We could not do what we do without you. So thank you for um, your support of our programming. Um, Professor Barrett has generously agreed to share his contact information. You will receive a follow-up email. So I know that we could not get to every single question, but if you do have remaining questions, um, you're welcome to send them to him and um, I'm sure he will do his best to answer all of them. Um, thank you again for joining us. We are having public programs like these twice a week. We are also having um, virtual teacher programs for those of you looking for teacher professional development. Um, so thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you virtually again sometime soon at one of our upcoming programs. Thank you. <laughs>